Uh, Megan, Philippa, Robert, the floor is all yours. Thank you. Okay. Hi, I'm going to get us started. Um, so I, we are here today. Welcome, first of all. Um, thank you for joining us. Um, we're going to be telling you today about um, a specific data repository here at ICPSR that we all work on, the National Neighborhood Data Archive, which we refer to by its acronym NANDA. Um, we'll be telling you a bit about how NANDA contains data sets that are created from publicly available data elsewhere that we use to study the role of neighborhood in health. Um, and we are excited to get started on that. Um, but before I get too far um, uh, down that road, I do want to give us all a minute to introduce ourselves. Um, um, my name is Megan Chenoweth. I am the data manager and curator for NANDA. I've been um, here for about a year now. I work at the Institute for Social Research within our Social Environment and Health program here at the University of Michigan. Um, and I am, as a data manager and curator, I write documentation, I help collaborate on the creation of new measures, uh, and I am responsible for uh, actually getting uh, data from our research team to NANDA. Um, I'd like to ask uh, Dr. Philippa Clark to go next and introduce herself, please. Hi everybody, I'm Philippa Clark. I am a professor in the Department of uh, Public Health at University of Michigan and also a faculty at the Institute for Social Research. And um, I am a, been doing neighborhood research for two decades or more and I'm fascinated to understand how the places that we live in are related to our health. My work focuses mostly on the built environment and how it relates to healthy aging and preventing disability. Um, and I'm really excited to share Nanda with you today. I, it's a great resource for those of you interested in neighborhood research. Great, thank you. And Robert, would you introduce yourself, please? Sure, I'm Robert Melendez. Um, I'm a data analyst at the Social Environment and Health. I've been at the Institute for Social Research since 2004, and I've been at SEH since 2006. And my role is I, I make uh, a lot of the contextual measures. Great. Okay. Thank you. Um, we're going to be covering kind of three main topics today. Um, I'm going to start with a little background um, on why neighborhood data is relevant to the study of health, what we use it for, and why we felt that it was important to create NANDA, this repository of neighborhood data at the national scale. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the NANDA repository itself and what you'll find there. Um, the measures we create, um, one of the things we're going to be talking about is how the measures that we create are um, primarily derived from other publicly available data, which makes NANDA kind of an interesting case study in the potential research impacts for um, secondary data use. So we'll talk about that. Um, and then lastly, we're going to address a question that sometimes comes up when we talk about NANDA, which is kind of why not just um, go back to the source data? What's the use of a data repository that contains mostly data that's derived from other publicly available data? So we're going to share some examples that I think will demonstrate why researchers benefit from using data in NANDA rather than trying to go back to the source for the data that we use to create it. So um, I'm, to get us started, I'm going to ask um, Philippa to speak to us a little bit about um, why neighborhoods matter to health, um, how we, um, the relevance of neighborhood context to the study of health. Philippa? Sure. So when we think about health from a social determinants of health perspective, it's considering things that are upstream. And when we think about upstream, we mean things that are the context in which um, health behaviors, for example, can play out to influ influence health. So for example, if we're thinking about things like um, smoking behavior or physical activity, the ability for someone to engage in uh, physical activity or to not smoke um, is partly a function of the environment in which they're living. So do they have access to parks? Do they have access to recreation centers? Um, what is the density of tobacco and liquor stores in their neighborhood? So a lot of the things that we think about in terms of 
um, that drive health are not just at the individual level, but in fact are very much conditioned upon the environments in which we are living. Do you want the next slide? I'm sorry. Sure, yeah. Um, so when we think about place, and a lot of the measures in NANDA are kind of thought about in terms of different features of the environment, there is the built and physical environment. So those are things that are kind of human made, the social um, and the economic environment, which are more things that are, are less um, visible on the streets, but actually play a big role in terms of shaping behavior, things like crime and poverty. And then we also think about larger things like policies, community policies and governments in terms of what is the compliance with the Americans with Disability Act um, transition plans? Uh, what are, are there neighborhood crime watch pr um, processes in place? And so when we, the measures that we have in NANDA kind of cover all these different dimensions of place um, from destinations and the built environment to climate, to poverty and crime, housing affordability, and um, more of the, the measures of neighborhood crime as well. Megan, go ahead. do you want me to speak about this one? Yeah, if you wouldn't mind, just um, a little bit of background on why we created NANDA. So the reason why I was really adamant that we needed a National Neighborhood Data Archive is that in my two decades of research looking at the role of neighborhoods for health, um, there's been a tremendous amount of redundancy across researchers uh, in creating neighborhood measures over and over again for different studies, but using the same measures. And the data are not shared, and so it can't be replicated and it can't also be then used by others. This is an incredible waste of effort, but it's also an incredible waste of federal dollars and funding dollars that are provided to investigators across a multitude of different grants to create these measures over and over again. So NANDA was really designed to be, to get rid of that waste, to get rid of that redundancy, and to promote the sharing of these kinds of neighborhood data for researchers to use across the spectrum and policymakers, and also to create measures that are actually very well created and very well measured, um, that are conceptually and theoretically relevant, and that have precision in how they are created. So we're gonna be talking a lot about those issues um, in the next few slides. Great, thank you. Um, so I'm gonna um, take over at this point and, so, and uh, now that you have a sense for why we look at neighborhoods in the study of health uh, and why we created NANDA, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the repository itself and, and what you'll find in it. Um, first, uh, just to make sure I cover the basics, this is the URL for NANDA. We are a uh, small but growing collection of data sets um, housed at ICPSR, specifically within um, the open ICPSR corner. Um, we are, uh, NANDA was created by the Social Environment and Health Program here at um, the Institute for Social Research. Um, ICPSR's parent organization. Um, and Social Environment and Health is an interdisciplinary research program. We've been around since the 1960s. We have faculty, postdocs, and graduate students that collaborate across um, many disciplines. We have epidemiologists, demographers, gerontologists, environmental health scholars, sociologists. We also have um, staff and students who have expertise in data science and programming and geospatial analysts, um, analysis and also data management. Um, so that's, that's us. We are, um, we are the ones who create NANDA and if you'd like to learn more about us, um, come check us out on Twitter. We are uh, at SEH Research. Okay, so NANDA uh, is a repository of what's called neighborhood contextual measures. Um, contextual measures are data sets that quantify some dimension of the environment, the physical environment, demographic, economic, social environment. Contextual measures are always geocoded, meaning they refer to a specific place. Um, so that place could be, uh, is often a census tract, or a zip code, or a city, it can be a county, it can be a school district, it can be as granular as a census block, but they always have that geocoding. 
Um, and we use contextual measures to study the interrelationship between individual health, population health, and the community, usually to understand the causes of health disparities. Generally, the way that's done is we take some data um, on about individuals, survey data, uh, medical records, some uh, data about individuals themselves. Um, that data has to contain an indication of where the, uh, the individual is located. So it has to say, this is their census block, this is their city, this is their zip code, something like that. And then we combine that data with contextual measures that are at the same geographic level. And once we've done that, we can run statistical tests and analysis to explore the relationship between the individual outcomes that you're finding um, that you're finding out about from that individual level data, your survey data, your medical records, whatever, and the neighborhood characteristics as found in the contextual measures. Uh, and to make it, and just to make it clear, um, it's the contextual measures that you find in that are found in NANDA, not the individual level data. So um, in this very simple example to kind of uh, demonstrate how we do that. We have um, a small set of data on individuals, um, their age, sex, BMI, and the census tract that they reside in. We have a set of contextual measures about their neighborhood that tells us about the number of parks that are in each census tract. And we can combine them on the tract um, to investigate if this were a much bigger data scale. For example, something like the relationship between BMI and the number of parks in somebody's neighborhood. So that's just a really simple example of the kind of analysis that's typically done with the measures in NANDA. I wanted to give you a little bit of detail about the scope and coverage of the contextual measures in NANDA. Um, all NANDA data sets cover all or most of the United States. They differ just a little bit in terms of their coverage of Alaska, Hawaii, and um, island territories and overseas possessions. Um, but as a general rule, they are national in scale. Most of them are geocoded at either the census tract or the zip code level. Census tract is most common. Um, we're making an effort to get more out there for zip code at the zip code level. Um, there are a couple of others. Um, but those two are, are, the, are the ones you will find most commonly. Um, most measures at present span the time period between about 2008 to 2018. Not every data set covers that whole period of time. It typically varies based on the source data that we can get. Um, but that's kind of roughly the window that you'll find in NANDA right now. Um, and a lot of those measures are longitudinal. So for example, a NANDA data set will contain, I'm gonna pick one uh, as an example, the number of hair salons in a census tract in each of the years from 2003 to 2017. Um, I remember when I started with NANDA being a little confused about um, what was gonna be the format of data that I would find here. We're basically talking about tabular data, right? These are rows and columns. Um, typically, there's one row per geographic location, sometimes one row per geographic location per year, and then one column or variable per attribute of the neighborhood that we're trying to measure. Um, the data in NANDA cover a pretty wide range of topics, as you can see here. Um, it, everything from the socioeconomic and demographic characteristics of neighborhoods and their residents, some about the kind of physical environment, the greens, uh, it's green space, transit available. Um, some focus on, more on the different types of resources that are available within neighborhoods, like um, you know, uh, grocery stores in a neighborhood, libraries in a neighborhood, um, healthcare services, social services. Um, we have a number of data sets that show kind of density of different kinds of what are called third places, sort of gathering places. Um, we add new topics regularly. We're in the process of developing a number of measures, um, and here's a few, a few that we are planning on adding in the future are documented here. NANDA measures, um, as I mentioned, come 
almost entirely from data that is publicly available elsewhere in some form or another. Um, this is a list of some of our most common ones. Not surprisingly, we draw a lot, a lot, a lot from the census uh, data, so the American Community Survey, the decennial census, and then for our geography, the tiger line shape files. Um, we also get data from um, other publicly available sources like the National Land Cover Database, um, the National Transit Map, and ParkServe. Um, except for the last one on the list, which we use for um, a lot of our neighborhood resources data sets, nearly all of this data, everything I highlighted in blue here, is publicly available elsewhere. So when you hear about, when you hear that everything in NANDA comes from publicly available data, it's kind of tempting to wonder, you know, why use data from NANDA at all? Um, why not go back to the source data and create your own measures for your own research? Um, there is a kernel of truth to that. If you are or you are collaborating with uh, very skilled data scientists and geospatial analysts who have um, a lot of expertise in computing resources and time and interest to create measures that are specifically customized to your research question and your sample, it could well, in some cases, be worth your time to do that. Um, but it obviously that is a pretty small number of people out of the overall potential group of NANDA users. Um, and even if it is entirely possible to reconstruct the same or similar measures based on publicly available data, um, there's plenty of reasons not to do that, not to reinvent the wheel and to use NANDA data instead. So, um, Robert and I are going to talk with you now about um, three data sets in NANDA that I think illustrate some of the benefits of uh, that researchers can get from using NANDA data instead of doing that, kind of recreating the wheel, so to speak, and trying to go back to the source. Um, and, I'm, uh, and before we get into those examples, let me just summarize what I hope they'll show you here. Um, one is, very simply, NANDA will save you time. Uh, even a very experienced programmer could benefit from the time saved by using NANDA measures. Um, another is you get the benefit of our team's expertise, um, whereas a researcher might understandably be more interested in a contextual measure as kind of a means to an end, a way of understanding their research question. Um, for our data analysts like um, Robert at um, Social Environment and Health, you know, this is their area of interest um, and their area of expertise. They're familiar with data sources and tools and the methodological issues that go into making measures. So if a researcher wants a, just a trustworthy measure to address their research question, you can get that from NANDA. Um, and then lastly, um, what you're going to see in these examples is that some of our measures, while they're derived from publicly available data, they contain additional insights from our team's research that you won't find in the source data. Um, so some data sets really are the result of us doing some analysis on the publicly available data, testing it within our own research, using it within our own research, and then creating new measures that represent the combination of the publicly available data in our research efforts. Okay, so I'm going to take you through um, three case studies that each involve a specific set of contextual measures um, that are either already on NANDA or will be coming in the future that are in development now. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about what each set of measures is, uh, and I'm going to ask Robert to tell you a little bit about the process of creating them. And I hope each of them is going to illustrate some of these benefits that you can get from using NANDA data. All right. So the first one I'd like to talk with you about um, is a data set that we are um, that we have worked on and are in the process of curating and publishing, and it is about um, street connectivity in the United States. Um, street connectivity. At, this matters to the study of health because um, 
having very interconnected streets, right, lots of intersections, um, close connections, um, it can both enable health promoting behavior. So for example, very connected streets may enable walking for transit. Uh, it can also inhibit some health promoting behavior in some contexts. So for example, if you have very highly interconnected streets, traffic may move faster and that could be hazardous for some slower moving pedestrians. Um, the formula for these measures, um, our, for our street connectivity measures, um, was taken from a paper written in 2010 by Berrigan and, um, and others um, who originally created it to test the effect of street connectivity on bicycle transit, um, specifically in two counties in California. And our contribution has been to do a couple of things. Uh, we adapted their measures um, so that they reflected an entire census tract instead of were specific to, um, uh, to a sample population. Uh, and we also created the measures um, beyond the two California counties, we created them for the entire country. Um, so at this point, um, Robert, if you can, um, I'd like to ask you to summarize the steps in the process, how you went about creating these measures, um, and just kind of give us a little insight on what that process was and kind of level of effort and time that went into it. Sure, sure. And I struggle with how technical to get, but I'll do the best I can. Um, so the original source data here are Tiger Line edges, which the census provides, um, and they come in zip files by county. So the first step was to download all of those data from um, from the census and I'm, <clears throat> I'm tempted to point at my screen. I know that feeling. An, an edge is more or less like a street block, the segment of a street between two intersections. <clears throat> And what Berrigan did was he, he um, sort of conceptualized streets and intersections as nodes and edges from sort of more general network analysis. And we created, so we, so I, I'm getting ahead of myself. So I had to grab all of the edges and then run a process through Python and via ArcGIS that intersects every street segment in the United States with every other one and identifies the intersection and the intersection becomes the nodes. So now I have nodes and edges. Uh, there, there's another, this is a, maybe this is a little bit too much detail. There's another process for getting dead ends. So those count to some extent too. So now I have nodes and edges and I have to take a, another shape, in this case, census tract or ZCTA, or it could really be any shape. And I have to link the nose and edges to that geography. So now I have nose and edges for every tract in the US. And now I just kind of went through the methodology section and applied all of these formulas to derive these different network measures. Yeah. And to, to give you a sense of scale, uh, these data occupy about 300 gigs on one of my hard drives and um, thousands of files and probably the process, the first process, just the, it's a massive Python script that runs GIS to make all of these connections. It runtime alone on that was probably about two weeks. That's just runtime. That's not like development time and that kind of yeah. thing. Yeah. So in addition to, you know, the time it takes to, to decide how you write the script for how you're going to do this, then just to run it. And that's on an extremely powerful machine. Thank you. Thank you for the, the um, over, overview. I appreciate it. Um, so um, what I am hoping to show you with this example is that, you know, in theory, um, the components to do the work that we did to develop these measures, and by we, I mean Robert, because I didn't do it. <laughs> um, the components are the tiger line shape files, the Berrigan paper, um, Python and ArcGIS, and a whole lot of computing space, really. 
Um, these are, to a greater or lesser extent, pretty widely available. Um, and, but using the measure that's already um, making its way to NANDA is a lot simpler. Uh, and it's going to save you, you know, two weeks plus. Okay. So for our second example, um, I want to talk a bit about um, another set of measures that we've created and published to NANDA. These are already published and up. This is our land cover data set. Um, it's derived from the National Land Cover Database. And for every, it covers every census tract in the United States. Uh, we're working on a version that covers every zip code in the United States as well. And it shows what percent of each tract is made up of what different type of land cover, um, which is to say, I'm going to throw out examples because it's the best way I can think of to explain what it is. You know, is it high density development? Is it farmland? Is it a swamp? Is it a forest? Is it open water? That kind of thing. Um, what got us interested in this from a health perspective is um, our researchers and others um, have published on the connection between land cover, specifically the presence of green space um, in a neighborhood and mental health. So that's kind of where our interest in it from a health perspective is. Um, so Robert, can you tell us a bit about the source data that you were working with and its format and then your process for converting these into measures by tract? Sure. Um, the process here was a little a little easier than street connectivity, but the it it's basically it's a it's a raster file. Put more simply, it's a huge image, and it, so that it's twenty gigs per year. And you can think of it as um, sort of a I, I don't want to say pixelated. So every pixel in this image represents a 30 by 30 meter area and it's coded with a different kind of land use. Um, so what I did was again using Python and ArcGIS and also Stata but that the last part is kind of irrelevant. Um, I clipped the image for every tract in the United States and I just pretty much counted the squares of every different value across the tract and then created these proportions. So this one was a little easier, but I, it's, I don't think most people have a computer that can open a 20 gig file. So, I mean, the average like laptop is eight gigs of RAM just to give you a sense. So this is, this one is very computationally intensive. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, I, you know, here again, I think we have another example of, you know, a researcher with access to the source data and um, a very powerful computer um, could have done what we did. Um, but our contribution here, I think, is, you know, we're, it, by using the land cover measures that we've already created, you know, researchers get to kind of bypass the question of, well, what data should I use for this? And what tools do I need? And, you know, how do I take this giant picture, really, and convert it into a numeric measure? And get straight, they can get straight to a trustworthy measure that's going to address um, their research question that interests them. Okay. And then I have one more example that I want to talk about, um, and it has to do with our most widely used and most widely, most downloaded um, NANDA data set, um, which is, it covers socioeconomic status and demographics. We have this data in NANDA at the census tract level for the years 2000 through 2017. And we have it at the zip code level for 2008 to 2017. Um, and embedded within this data set are two measures that um, 
were created by our research team. So we, uh, the source data I should have mentioned comes from the American Community Survey and the decennial census. Um, but along with it is these two novel measures that our team created. One is uh, an index that represents neighborhood disadvantage. Um, and the other is a separate index that represents each neighborhood's affluence. Um, Philippa, uh, would you be willing to speak with us just briefly about the relevance of disadvantage and affluence and the difference between the two and why they matter to health? Absolutely. So I think many people know that disadvantage or socioeconomic disadvantage at the neighborhood level represents concentrated poverty and disinvestment in a community, essentially. Um, and there's a growing literature and there's an established literature showing the relationship between residents in a disadvantaged area and a lot of negative health outcomes and a lot of behavioral outcomes, especially in children. Um, but there's less well that studied in terms of the, the opposite factor, which is neighborhood affluence. And it's important to note that what, na what affluence is and how it's distinct from disadvantage. And affluence really gets at social capital. So it's areas that are, are characterized by having a large proportion of highly educated residents who are working in professional managerial occupations with relatively high incomes. And what it's getting at is power, essentially, and power to advocate for change and resources in one's neighborhood. Um, and so we often see these kind of neighborhoods in, and they can be characterized um, through gentrification as well. And they are distinct from simply a neighborhood that is low in disadvantage uh, in the sense that it's not simply the absence of disadvantage in a neighborhood that is giving it power, but it is in fact the higher levels of affluence. It's having those people there that can advocate and argue um, and can bring resources into the neighborhood. And there's a lot of literature showing and growing literature showing that these two different things, disadvantage and affluence, in fact, operate very differently on health. Um, and it's important to consider them both. Great, thank you. Um, so with this data set on NANDA, um, as I mentioned, the demographic data from that you'll find within this data set comes directly from census data, from either the census, uh, the decennial census or the American Community Survey, depending on the year. So for example, it has things like just straight up total population, um, percentages of population in the per tract or um, by age and race, um, proportions of households by income, percentages of female headed households, so those, those kinds of demographic data that might be familiar from some of the from census data that you may have worked with before. But these disadvantage and affluence indices um, are the result of our team's efforts to construct a set of variables that would characterize the socio-demographic structure of census tracts over time. Um, Robert, can you tell us a bit about the methodology that was used um, to make these two indices? Sure. Um, back in the mid 2000s, uh, under the guidance of demographers and sociologists at SEH, um, we ran a factor analysis. At first, it was for Cook County for a Chicago based study. Um, and at the time, it was, I believe it was novel that we actually were able to identify two different factors for disadvantage and affluence. Um, so Guided by that, we later, I don't want to say I, we ran a factor analysis on all of the tracks in the United States uh, based on the decennial census 2000 and the factors held up. So based on that, what, we're, what we actually have put out on NANDA, they're not actually the factors to make it more kind of interpretable they're actually scales based on the factor loadings for disadvantage and affluence. Um, <clears throat> do you want me to be specific about the loadings and maybe that's too much? What I, um, I, actually what I was thinking was the piece that we had not covered is what are the, if you, if you remember, 
what are the census indicators that went into oh sure sure, the sure. Like, so yeah. disadvantage there's actually two versions um one has it's basically mean proportions of these variables i'll tell you it's uh percent non-hispanic black percent female headed households percent on public assistance uh, percent of families in poverty and percent unemployment. That's disadvantage. And there's another version that removes percent black. Um, and for affluence, it's percent with income above 75,000, percent college educated, and percent, a percent in professional or managerial um, occupations. And for 2010, we use the same measures or very comparable measures um, in ACS 2008 to 2012 summary file. We use ACS 20, 2008 to 2012 because unfortunately the 2010 census didn't have all of the measures we needed for this for these factors. So we ran that factor analysis again in 2010 and they, it, they held up. So we, that was pretty cool. But in the data set also we interpret, interpolated the years in between. Okay, thank you. Um, what I love, love, love about this example um, is it illustrates um, how well Nanda is this com can be this combination of primary research and secondary data reuse, right? So the source data is from the census, but the index variables are our team's research output. Um, and users of this data set are getting a lot more than a convenient repackaging of census data, right? They're getting a theoretically informed, tested, out-of-the-box measure of disadvantage and affluence to use in their own um, analyses. And that would just not be possible without what we're um, putting on NANDA. Okay, so um, what can we take away from these examples? Um, on a very practical consideration, I always want to bring it back to the practical. I hope you'll remember where to find us so that if you are curious about NANDA and the other measures that we have there, um, you can come and explore um, our URL. Uh, this is our URL. Um, second, I hope that you've gotten a sense for um, the kind of data that you'll find in NANDA and what it's used for and what it's useful for. So to recap, if you have geocoded uh, data about individuals, so survey data, um, administrative data, uh, medical records, that kind of thing, and you want to learn something about their environment, their neighborhood, their uh, physical environment, the natural environment, the socioeconomic environment, um, that is what NANDA is good for. NANDA will give you um, a, NANDA will give you that information about the environment. Um, and then third, I hope that we've kind of shown the value of, you know, that you can get from a repository of secondary data um, measures, right? Um, when you think about this year's data fair theme of um, data in the wild, you know, we are that. We are what happens to census data uh, after it goes out and gets um, integrated into, um, into other studies, right? We are what happens when you, um, uh, when you use uh, census data, again, for example, to kind of um, to study data on individuals, and then we are contributing that back out uh, uh, for others to take advantage of. Um, so yeah, we are making use of publicly available data and we are using it to create new research products that um, inform research on health and healthy aging. Okay, so um, just in conclusion, I just wanna say a couple of quick thank yous. Um, First of all, to Nanda's funders, we are funded with grants from the National Institute on Aging and uh, NIDLR, um, the National Institute on Disability, Independent Living and Rehabilitation Research. Um, 
And so thank you to them for making this possible. Um, I also want to thank the organizers of the data fair for inviting us and making this possible. Uh, and I want to thank all of you who have joined us for this session. Uh, we're glad that you could be here. Um, and we would welcome any questions that you have. Thank you so much to all of you. I really appreciate uh, learning more about the, the, the NANDA repository. Um, we have several questions coming in here, it looks like. So um, let's see, I'll start with one of the more recent ones we received. Um, has your group done any research on perceptions of those in the sense, oops, and it's scrolled, <laughs> uh, on perceptions of those in the census designated neighborhood as to whether they recognize those as the boundaries of what they consider their neighborhood, trying to get at the cultural and lived experience of neighborhood and the ways in which that may manifest in behavior and policies. Yeah, um, Philippa, I'd love to, to have you weigh in on this one. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. Amazing question. And in fact, we are in the middle of a study right now that is comparing older adults' perceptions of what they consider to be the boundaries of their neighborhood with more you know, traditional census tract boundaries. So, and, and actually, I'm trying to understand exactly what are the differences um, in perceptions based on age. So do older people, do their neighborhoods shrink? Do they, they see sort of a smaller area? So how does our perception of our neighborhoods change depending on our function and our age? So a great question. I wouldn't mind talking a little bit about that. Yes, absolutely. Because this is one of my, uh, I'm working on now, it's a lot of fun. Uh, <laughs> so to get at this question, I tried to get to the most granular level possible that I could with polygons, which right now is census block. Um, which pretty much represents a regular city block. So I had to make, I have already made a contiguity matrix of every block in the United States, which is, uh, if you think of pieces, if you think of a chessboard, um, a given square would be a census block. So a contiguity matrix is the set of blocks surrounding it. Um, given, you know, with, so either, if you think of, let's say there's queen contiguity and rook contiguity. Queen contiguity is any point touching. So if a square is in the middle, the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight squares surrounding it. If So if you can go out to two or three, I've, I've gone out to 10. So I have terabytes and terabytes of data for these contiguity matrices. Um, but at the end, what I end up with is just some shape linked to a single block and given that shape I can make whatever contextual measure I want so I'm kind of excited about that one. Thank you. I see a couple of other questions here about the affluence and disadvantage measures so um, the first question is how are they related and what are the ranges of these values? We'll start there and then I'll go into the next. Well the range is easy it's it's a mean of proportion, so they go between zero and one. Um, how are they related? They're, they're means of different proportions. They certainly correlate to some extent, but they're meant to measure these separate factors. Uh, and just to speak about that, in the factor analysis, it was conducted with an orthogonal rotation so that they are, in fact, although they may be correlated, they're distinct. They're actual distinct dimensions. Great, thank you. Yeah, the other question that I see uh, relating to these measures uh, uh, is a question wondering if they are related to Bob Sampson's work or just more broadly, whether or not you work with other researchers to validate measures. So these are definitely derived from a sociological perspective of disadvantage and affluence. And um, Jeff Moranoff was one of the original scholars who was involved in the creation of these measures back in the mid 2000s, as Robert indicated. Um, in terms of validating them, we are we validate it to the extent that we consistently show that they are related to multiple health outcomes. They're related to depression. They're related to um, other resources in neighborhoods. They're related to cognitive function in individuals. So so um, to the extent that that captures the validity of them, uh, we certainly have consistent evidence for that. 
Thanks. Um, another somewhat similar question here on a, on a different measure. So have you done any comparison to other composite measures of socioeconomic status out there like the social deprivation index? We have not. Um, Megan, do you want to comment on that? I, would, uh, I was only going to ask, did you like, no. <laughs> Go ahead, Philippa, please. I think you'll have the best answer. Um, no, and it would be an interesting, actually, thing to do to see how are they are correlating with more of these emerging um, indices that are coming out. Um, again, ours are derived more theoretically, so they may be different because they're based on really um, this factor analysis, not just something that is imposed upon by the research researcher. So the data are speaking for themselves about what indicators should be hanging together to capture disadvantage and affluence. I'm scanning through for some others. Um, another question here is, how do you account for the complex survey sampling design of the US Census and American Community Survey and the statistical analysis with, with some Yonanda data? I'm sorry, can, can I, I hate to do this. Can I ask you to repeat that? Oh, of course, of course. Uh, just uh, th this question is about how to account for the complex survey sampling designs of the data sets that you work with. Uh, so, Philippa, you may have some thoughts on clustering for uh, for this, or related. I think the question is about the census data, oh. and Robert oh, sorry. is the best person to answer this okay. about the the fact that they're five year estimates. Um, uh, misunderstood. Okay. Okay. Um, well, the two thousand data is a census, so we take it as it is. <laughs> the um, as far as ACS, they have guidelines and error, so they will, um, we just kind of have to accept as a limitation. They do censor some, some, um, some tracks if they're too low on some measures, but we just have to accept that as a limitation, I mean. Oh, sounds good. We are running short on time now since we want to make sure that the, uh, the, the next presentation has ample time to, to get set up and people have a chance to have a break before the next session. So um, I know that there are a lot of questions here actually that we did not get a chance to get to. So um, I'm, I'm glad that there's so much interest in the work that, uh, that is being done through the National Neighborhood Data Archive. And um, might I suggest that they reach out to you all with any questions that they have? Absolutely. Great. Thank you all so much for your time today. We really appreciate uh, all of the time and expertise that you have shared with us today. Thank you very much.